504. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet. There's some, some hidden talent out there, so appreciate you fellas singing. my redemption when you broke sin's power and set my spirit free I'm amazed that you love me I'm amazed how you care through your precious blood I found pardon and my sin you know the many times I've gone astray, but I've learned your love is stronger than my weakness, and your ear is opened every time I pray. No one else has ever cared for me like you, Lord. Other friends could never be as close to me. I'm not afraid to face the problems of tomorrow, knowing you are everything I'll ever need. I'm amazed that you love me. Amen. 
you love me. I'm amazed how you care. Through your precious blood, I found pardon. And my sins are washed. They're all washed away. All my sins are washed away. All my sins are washed away. Praise the Lord for that truth that uh, my sins are all washed away and that I'm amazed that He loves me. Think about, think about that. Each one of us have things we've done that we know are against God, right? Nobody's perfect. Brother Russell's not perfect. We've all done things we wish we haven't done. Aren't you glad that God still looks at us and loves us and says, I love you so much that I'll die in your place? Your, your sins can be washed in the blood, and you can be forgiven. And so our sins are washed away. Why? Because He loves us. And why does He love us? Only He knows, but I'm so glad He does. And so let's go ahead and, um, and uh, turn in our Bibles over to Titus. Titus in chapter number 2. Titus is chapter number 2 here this morning as we look at, get a chance to uh, study about fathers here a little bit here this morning. And so thankful, by the way, that, that uh, what's given is not just for fathers. There's a lot of application here that's going to be for uh, men that are not fathers, and a lot of application as well that's going to be for uh, ladies that are here today too. So, so looking forward to God's Word. We're going to go over to Titus chapter number 2, and we'll start off in verse number 1. Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 1. And so that's, that's over in the New Testament, towards the back uh, quite a bit, but Titus chapter number 2, verse number 1. And this is uh, Apostle Paul, and he's writing to uh, Titus, and so he's giving him instruction. And so here we're going to pick up here in chapter number 2. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And then verse number 2, That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women... Likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And so I'm not sure if, uh, if Paul got in trouble for calling some ladies aged. I don't know. But so anyways, he, uh, but he, he, he still made the application here, and there's still, some, of course, some good things to, um, to, to, be, to be seen. But verse number four says, that they might teach the, younger, the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. And verse number five says, To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That, and it says, Young men likewise exhort to be sober minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So here we have instruction that is given, first of all, to Titus in verse number one, then to the aged men, then to the aged women, and then to the younger women, and then to the young men. And so we're not going to get a chance really to go into as much today to the, uh, to when it's addressing the ladies. So that's uh, just going to you know, be for another time. So we're going to look at mainly at the things that address the young men. But, the, the, but to me, it's, some of them actually are both on both lists here to the ladies as well. And so we're going to be able to touch on those. And then, um, and then the ones that I believe apply to the men also can apply many times to the ladies too. So let's go ahead and pray and ask God's blessing as we look to His Word. Father, Lord, it's Your Word, and Lord, You're God. And so thank you so much that, Lord, that, that we have the Word of God, the Bible that you gave us, or our instruction, our letter that's from you that shows your love, uh, understanding salvation, how we can be forgiven. And there's no, uh, no, uh, no, uh, doesn't, shouldn't surprise us to know that the, the Bible has the, is, the, is the book that's in, in, in every single country and has sold the most copies. And that it's, it's an amazing, the most amazing book. Why? Because, Lord, you wrote it. And you gave it to us that we may know you and we may be saved and we may have instruction for our families. And today we're looking here at men. Lord, I pray you help us men, especially and the ladies as well, to receive application. And I pray you bless the message, Lord, not because of me, but because of you. And so I pray you help even in my deficiencies. And Lord, I pray you just give us from your word today what we need. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's just look here at the first verse as we get started. That's what I want to say. The title of the uh, the title of the message is "May the young men and old men be real men." May the young men 
and old men be real men. So we're going to look at that here today as, uh, as, as we uh, get started. Well, let's, but first of all, the first verse here as we look at it, it mentions Titus. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And so, um, so basically what it's saying is give uh, wise instruction. So he's telling Titus, he says, when you speak, uh, let, your speak let your instruction become sound doctrine. May be accurate, may be true, may be sound. And so I think that's something for all of us. When you say something, let your, let your words be based upon God's word. Let your words, when they, when they come from you, be something that's going to be sound. And not just, you know, someone can hear that and say, well, I don't, I don't know if that's going to help me. Or I'm not sure if that's wise, wise words. Or I'm not sure if that's uh, something that's accurate. And so well, the more we understand God's word and the more we follow his word, then the more our, our instruction can become sound instruction. Right? Who likes to help people? Who likes to, if somebody is struggling, who likes to give them truth and say, hey, this is something that's going to be helpful. And so the only way to do that is to receive wisdom and instruction from God and be able to pass that along. And so anybody ever heard someone telling you something and you're like, I don't think that's good, good advice. Anybody ever heard that before? And so, but you know, how can you always give good advice when you use God's word to give it instead? And so, um, so, um, so be leaders, uh, leaders, uh, to be a leader means to bear the responsibility. To bear the responsibility. So I just want to challenge us men, brought from the start just by way of introduction, to be the men that God wants us to be. And so God wants men to be leaders. And God wants men to step up and be the leaders of their homes, to be the leaders of, uh, in, in, in the people that are around. And we need men to be leaders. We need men to step up. Too many times men, they don't, they don't want to step up. They, don't, they want to hide out, and they don't, they don't want to, to be able to stand up in their, in, their, in their family and say, hey, I believe this is best for our family. This is what we should do. So men, we, we have that responsibility from God, and He can help us to do that. So um, let's look over in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. And just, just want to just set, set an understanding here of just a couple quick thoughts by an introduction. And so Ephesians chapter number 5, so back up there if you're in Titus, in verse number 23. Ephesians 5, 23 says, But for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. And so here it shows from this verse and many others as well that men are supposed to be leader. They're supposed to take that responsibility that God's given them and lead their families. And so, and sometimes that means putting yourself last and say, you know, it's not about me. It's about our family or it's about the Lord. And so, um, so uh, sometimes people say, oh, I'm the head. That means I get to be like, tell everybody what to do. Right? I'm in charge. You know, listen to me. You know, no, that's not what being a leader is. And tr a true leader is going to be a servant. And so if you're a boss at a job or if you um, have people under you or if you're a dad or if you're a mom or you're, you're a teacher of any sort, you're going to be a leader. Even if you're a teenager, there's people watching you. You're going to be a leader. And so to be a true leader means you're not thinking about yourself. You want to lead and, and help others. And so, but so to take that responsibility, so first of all, men, let's be the, the leaders that God's called us to be. Amen? Are you ready to step up? Ladies, you get to lead in, 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 in a lot of ways as well. You're ready to step up and say, I want, I want to be the, a good example as people follow. And so, and so God gave this responsibility. So this is something God gave that it tells us for the men to be the leaders. And so um, that God commanded. He's the one that commanded it. And so then that, this is what God made you for, men. God made us to be leaders. And so with God's help, we can. So someone would say, well, Brother Russell, I don't, I don't know if I could do that. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm a little bit of scared to try. What if I mess up? You feel that way? Well, I remember the first time that uh, I was getting ready to get married, and I'm like, man, I'm going to be a husband? Oh, I don't know how to do this, right? And I remember the first time when I knew I was going to be a dad, oh, I don't know how to do this. You know what? When God commands you to do something, He will give you the power to obey it. Amen? God will give you the power and the help to obey what He's told you to do. So you just say, God, you're, you said you're going to help me, then I'm going to do what you told me to do and, and be that leader. So that's just by way of introduction. Men, let's be leaders and let God help us do what He's asked us to do. And then, um, so, so now as we look over back over to Titus chapter number 2, and look at the second verse. It says that the aged men be sober. And so I just uh, wrote right there where it says aged men. I wrote in my notes here that 46 and above. Right? That's, that's the old guys. And I'm 45. So I'm just kidding around though. But uh, you know what? Uh, really I think that uh, it's talking about people that have experience, people that have wisdom, people that's been on uh, this world a little bit longer that um, they can help. And so it's talking about those that, uh, that uh, should be looked up to because of their age. And so it's talking about the aged men. And it mentions several things here. The first one it says is uh, to be sober. To be sober. 
And that word sober, if you look it up, it doesn't, it, it doesn't necessarily mean not drunk, all right, or not own something. It doesn't necessarily mean that, even though it has that same idea in some ways. But this is what it means. It means to be aware or be vigilant, seeing the danger beforehand. So to, to be, to be a, 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 a on the lookout, to be able to see things before they happen, to be able to see a, a potential problem or a, 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 something that would be bad and say, whoa, 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 I see, I see a problem here. We need, to, we need to head this off before it gets here. And so, um, so that's the first thing. So being sober means you're being aware or you're being vigilant or you're being circumspect. You're looking at something. You're saying, wait, something doesn't look right here. Or I can see a problem could be up there. could be some issues going on here. And so we need to be careful. And as a dad, I, I, uh, there's sometimes when, when a, uh, my daughters will say, dad, can I do this um, can I can I take you you know can I can I go this over to this place and I and I know that place is kind of out in the woods or out by itself and there's nobody there and I'll say you know if it's just them want to go out and I, I'll say no right why because I can see that could be a potential problem there what if some bad person would be around right and or I would say hey you need to you need to be prepared and so we have some radios you take your radio and you let me know when you get there you let me know when you get back right or I can say hey you need to you need to be armed right and you, you be ready to protect yourself and so on and so there's just different things you can do why because i think it's especially important for a husband and a father to be able to look at his at his at his at the situation and say i want to make sure and see the problem before it happens protect that's one of the things a father is supposed to do so if you're a father here today be able to see those things before they take place and i even I even take that responsibility as a pastor to see you know it as a church to make sure that a church is safe and make sure there's nothing that could harm in any way and so those are things that are uh, being sober right sober basically means uh, you're 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 you're, uh, you're you're seeing all these different things potential problems before they take place but not just physical or those type of things but even spiritual spiritual situations where you maybe there's you see somebody that's going the wrong direction or, or saying the wrong things or having a wrong attitude and, and and lovingly you can say hey I don't think that's going to be helpful for you I think that's going to cause problems and so so being able to see those things before they take place but um let's look at um 1 Corinthians 15:34 and, I, and I'll, I'll just read it to you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15:34 says, "Awake to righteousness, and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame." So one of the ways we can be sober is when it comes to other people not knowing Christ, someone that needs to get saved. And so to be sober means you're aware of that situation. So you see somebody that doesn't know Christ. And maybe you're playing basketball with them or whatever. And you say, man, I can, I can, I can see that they're just, they're, just, they're just not following the Lord in their life. And so be able to see that situation and see where they're heading and be able to say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. To be aware means you see that they need Christ. To not be aware means you're asleep, right? You're like, you're not even, you're not even uh, aware of it. And so that's why it says awake. And uh, it says awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He's saying, wake up. Be sober. Wake up, right? You need to see this, this problem before it happens. This, they need to, uh, maybe someone's getting older and they don't know Christ. And you say, hey, they're, they're, their time is ticking. They're going to stand before God someday. We need to tell them so they don't die and go to hell without Christ. And so, um, so that, that's an uh, understanding of sober as well. Also, um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 it says, let us, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So um, to wake up in the, in the, to, to what we need to be doing. And so kind of uh, have a kind of an idea of that when uh, we have a great Pyrenees dog. And uh, today uh, I, got a, I got a little Father's Day uh, present from, from one of my younger daughters. And anyways, I got that Father's Day present. And they had put together this little uh, plastic thing and they would ironed it. And it was in the shape of a dog. And they said, this is Cody. And he said, this, that's our dog. He's, he's a big old, if only if you ever met him before, he's, he's a big old mo monster of a, of, a, of a dog. But he doesn't bite, but he likes to bark. But anyways, he's big. But Cody, is a, uh, he's a great Pyrenees, and they are bred to watch sheep. In fact, if you put them at, with a sheep as a little baby, then they will stay with the sheep. And if you come out there, they're going to bark at you saying, hey, I'm watching you. Or, I want to protect these sheep. That's kind of how they are. And so uh, one of the things about Cody is he'll just be sitting there, and he's always just kind of looking. He's just looking out there, and sometimes he sleeps. I guess he's not always on the job. But, but anyways, he's out there just looking around. He's just watching. And sometimes he'll, he'll be looking out there, way out there, and I'll be like, man, he'll start barking. I'm like, what is he? I can't, oh, there's some deer way out there. I can see something way out there. He's just always watching. And that's what it means to be sober. It means always watching, to be awake, to be paying attention. And so, and so why, the, why? Because the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom we may devour. 
He wants to destroy your life. That's why we need to be awake, paying attention, right? Always ready. Seeing, seeing maybe a, a, bad, a bad temptation coming or seeing something wrong that's coming our way. And so, first of all, sober. And so we need to be always on guard. And so um, uh, cell phones and computers, uh, we need to be on guard about those. You say, well, uh, so does, does your little child have a cell phone? Do, 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 are, you, are you aware of what's on there? Something to know, right? I mean, you should set some uh, boundaries on those things. Why? Because there's things there. And so we just need to always be aware. If, you, if you're an adult, we need to be always aware of what can pop up or what can be coming or what websites and different things. So we need to be aware of uh, and, and, and head those off. Why? Because the devil's trying. He's trying his best to wreck and run and cause trouble. And sometimes uh, things that can come into our mind, they, they can't be erased. They stay in there. Right, and so we just—I just want to give a a, a, a admonition to us, uh, especially to the men, because um, that's what that's that's our eyes. Is we need to be real careful, because that's that's uh, how God is. He's 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 made us that way. Our eyes, you know, they see things and those things stick. And so I'm sure that uh, ladies as well, could, there could be some application somewhat as well there as well. And so um, then wrong friends. I remember when I was a uh, when I was uh, a, a teenager, and my dad he, he uh, basically said, uh, "Son," he said. Uh, you can't be hanging around those people anymore. And you know, some, some with some friends, I knew those, they they had some 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 pretty major issues. My dad said you can't be hanging around them anymore. You can't, you know, it's not going to be helpful for you. And so what my dad was trying to do, he was being sober. He was saying, I can see a problem right here, son. This is not going to be good for you. You don't need to be. You don't need to be. You don't need to be in that environment. And he'd always say, birds of a feather flock together. You know, are you are who you hang around. He'd, you know, he'd tell me those things, and so we need to take those, and, and so on. Um, so being sober. The next uh, grave. Next is grave. The age, the age men be grave. And so grave or gravity, that word grave or gravity doesn't necessarily mean something that's holding you to the floor. Right? Grave means, it means honorable or respected. Honorable or respected or honest. And so 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse number uh, 4 says this, and this is when um, uh, the qualifications of a bishop, they must have these qualifications. And it says, one that ruleth well his own house. And so 1 Timothy 3, 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And so I was, I was thinking about that. It's, to me it's interesting. Of course, I had to first look up the word gravity because I thought it you know, basically means what holds you on the ground, right? So, uh, so have your children in subjection and make sure they're on the ground. That's not what it's talking about. Make sure your children are not floating away. That's not what it's talking about. You know, it's not talking about gravity holding them down. So basically what it means is you have your children in subjection means that you are, um, they, they are underneath your, your, your power and your authority, but they also with all gravity. So they ha you have their respect. You have their honor. Does that make sense? So, um, so I don't, I don't, uh, I, a father shouldn't rule this way. He shouldn't rule this way or, or lead this way. Uh, you know, children, you're going to do what I say, and I don't care what you think about it, and you're going to, 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 you're just going to do these things, and, and it's, there's no other choice for you. And kids are going to like, well, okay, dad, if you say that, but you wait till I get a chance, I'm out of here, right? That's not, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is you have such a respect that you have with them, and they can see you in your life, that you can say, hey, I think this is what we should do. And they're like, oh, you know what, Dad? If you think that's what we should do, I know you love the Lord, and I know you're trying your best. I know you're not perfect. But, Dad, and I love you too, and we're, we're going to do it. That's, that's, that's that word, uh, uh, gravity. Does that make sense? And so we, we need to have that, fathers. And, that, and by the way, respect is not something you demand. Respect is something you earn. True? So you, 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 if, if, if you want respect, you have to give respect. You have to earn respect. You earn respect by uh, your reputation and how you treat people and all different things and, of course, knowing the Lord. And so, so that's why um, uh, gravity, honorable and honest and respected, one that ruled well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And so, um, so we need to be able to have respect and have that honor when it comes to other people. And then temperate. Temperate. And so back there in Timothy chapter 2, and it says here, um, it says grave and temperate. And temperate it just basically means uh, having self-control. I mean, having control of yourself. I mean, you can be able to tell yourself no, right? You know what I'm saying? There's some times when you need to tell yourself, no, you can't do that. In fact, there's quite a few times, right? You shouldn't always, I mean, if you want to go out and look at a, uh, a Corvette 70,000 car and you know you can't afford it, there's some times you say, no, you can't have it, right? No. 
I mean, so there's just different things and times when you say, uh, you realize that it's not going to be helpful at the time, and you, there's some times, but that's just a, a physical thing, but there's a many other times when you, when you say you're tempted and you say no, or whether it's uh, uh, addiction and you say no, right? I'm not going to do that. That's self-control. So let's look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 24. And it says here, it's the Apostle Paul, and he's given this first letter to the Corinthians. And this is what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. So anybody ever done a track and field? You want to win, right? That's what it's saying. That's what it's saying. It says, uh, you, you run a race, but only one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. So if you're going to do it, try to win. Right? If you're going to enter, do your best to win. That's what it's saying. But it says, um, then it goes on and says, and then every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. And so, um, so that's that word self-control. So if you're going to, um, if you're going to run a marathon, and, I'm, and actually I'm not going to run a marathon, but I am going to attempt to run a half marathon in October. And so uh, that's, that's coming up. So I'm going to have to train for that, right? I'm going to attempt it. You say, well, why are you doing that, Brother Russell? Well, I have a friend of mine who lives in Texas that runs. And anyway, he's a good friend, and his, his, his dad had passed away. And so this is going to be a memorial of his dad. And so he says, hey, I'm going to run a half marathon. In fact, I'm going to put the whole thing together. Are you going to come and run with me? And I said, no, he, didn't, he actually didn't say that. He says, you're going to do it, right? I'm like, Okay. <laughs> Sign me up. So I'm going to do it. I'm not sure how it's going to happen. I mean, he says, run a marathon. It may be run and walk. I don't know for sure, but we're going to see how it goes. And so, but anyways, if you're going to, if you're going to train for something, how do you train? Take self-control, right? And so, okay, well, I got this many, this many uh, months left before I'm going to get out there. I better not wait till the night before. Does that make sense? It's not going to be so well, if I, especially at 45. It's not going to go well if you wait till the night before. I mean, you're going to pull something probably. You probably might even not even finish at all. And so, but I have to start training. I'll have to, there'll be some times where I say, ah, I don't feel like running today. But I better get out there and I better put in a, a, at least a mile or two, right? And, and, and start working on those and start trying my best to do that. And so it's going to take some self-control. So that's what it's saying. You have to be temperate if you're going to strive for the mastery. If you're going to master something, you're going to have, so have to have some self-control. It's the same way with college, isn't it? There's not going to be always time you want to get, you get, go to school. There's not going to be always, so this is, this is not a lesson that really is, I don't, I'm not even interested. This don't interest me at all. I don't know why. But you know what? You're going to get a grade. You're going to pass your classes. You better put in some time. You better have self-control. It says, okay, I'm going to do it. Or maybe it's getting up in the morning and, and, and studying the Word of God. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to put some time into it. It's going to be some times when it's hard. It's going to be, have, so there's, it's going to be that way. You know, in all of your life, there's going to be hard times when you're going to have to say, okay, this is what I need to do. This is what I must do. I better have self-control. Temperate. And so, um, so let's look here in 1 Corinthians 15, and let's look here what it says. Um, Verse number 25, it says, now, it says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, has self-control. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, a trophy, or a ribbon. He says, but we an incorruptible. So we do it that we may uh, stand before God someday and say, hey God, I've I done my best for you. In fact, God says if we, anytime we're tempted, He says when we say no, we're going to be rewarded for that. Every single time. If you're tempted about to do something wrong, and you say, God, with your help, I'm going to say, no. God says, I'm going to recognize that someday. So we're going to receive an incorruptible crown someday for that. We're going to receive incorruptible rewards for that someday. <laughs> then he goes on to say this, I therefore so run. This is the Apostle Paul. Not as uncertainty, so fight I. So he says, I'm doing it with a plan. It says, not as one that beateth the air. So it means he is doing it with own purpose. He is, he is trying his best to accomplish and so, and I believe this actually he comes from, even in that day there was times when people would, would box or fight. And he says, um, if I am going to fight, I'm not just going to be beating the air. Right? <laughs> if I'm going to box, if you're boxing somebody, you just don't want to swing and, and hit air, right? So, I mean, he's, he's, he's using this analogy because that was kind of like a, they had Olympic type things back in those days as well. And, and I'm sure that one of the most oldest sports was, hey, me and you, let's go, Right? Well, and maybe it wasn't, and I use some of you ladies, like, would men do that just for fun? Sorry, ladies. 
Men are kind of crazy like that, and they would, right? And I've seen it. I've seen it myself personally when I was growing up. But you know, just and just and they would do that for fun. But it, Paul says, if I'm going to strive to be the best, I'm not just going to swing at the air. I want I want my punches to count, right? And that's just that analogy is the same way in the spiritual realm is what he's trying to say. If I'm going to serve God with all my heart, I want my whole life to count. For God. I want, I want everything I do to count for Him. This is not for a trophy. This is not for a ribbon. This guy, someday I'm going to stand before Jesus and I want Him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want my life to count. Does that make sense? So I'm just not, I don't want to be out there just beating the air. I don't want to be out there just spinning my wheels and, and not going anywhere. I want to make my life count. That's what Apostle Paul is saying. And so that's what, um, that's what it means to be temperate. It means you have control of yourself that you say, okay, I am going to do what I need to do, when I'm supposed to do it, and how I'm supposed to do it for the Lord. Not for me, for Him. And so that is, that's temperate. And the last verse here it says, how are you going to do that? This is how, this is this explanation in verse number 27. But I keep under my body, it says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And there is the, really the definition right there of temperance, is to keep under my body and bring it under subjection. So who's in control of you? Is God in control of you? Are you, are you saying, I'm going to do it, you, body, I'm going to make you do what God wants you to do, or am I going to let my body do what it wants to do? Because if you let your body do what it wants to do, you'll probably sleep in, you'll probably miss work, right? You won't read your Bible, you, you'll, 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 you'll go to um, amusement mode, and you know what amusement means? So I learned this a long time ago, I didn't know this at first, someone taught me. Muse means to think, right? It just means to think. The, put the letter A in front of it, it means not to think, right? So amusement basically means not to think. So when you go do something, I guess they call it amusement park, you don't, you don't figure out, how am I going to stay on this roller coaster? You just say, I'm just going to get on, and I'm not even going to think about it, right? Let's just do it. And, and you scream and holler. And that's, that, they call it amusement. It's a place you can go and do stuff without even having to think about it, I guess. It's, so amusement means not to think. And so here we see that, um, that when it comes to uh, our, our, our uh, temperance, there's gonna, if you just let your body do what it wants to do, you're going to go into amusement mode. Instead of trying to become better or, or grow, you're going to say, hey, let's just watch this movie that I've seen 20 times that may not be good for you anyway. And, we're just going to, you're just going to just, and there's nothing wrong with having some amusement, right? But if we're not careful, we're going to default back to that and basically say, body, yeah, you want to do it? Let's just do it. We're just going to do it. Body, if you want to only have uh, uh, Cokes and Twinkies for lunch, then that's okay, body. <laughs> right? But sometimes you got to say, body, no, you need some, you need some protein. You need some healthy stuff. You need it. You need to be strong. You need it. So, um, so that's just kind of a, a understanding of temperance. Can we tell ourselves what to do? That's what Paul is saying right here. He says, um, let's the, he says, um, that and bring it unto subjection. We have to make sure our body is is um, we're leading our body instead of our body leading us. Does that make sense? And so, uh, so temperance. And then next thing we you see here is sound in faith. So back in Titus chapter number two. Back in back in Titus chapter number two. And it says here in, in verse uh, number two, it says, sound in faith. And so that's the next thing right there. Sound in faith means strong in faith or, or, or having your faith strong. And so first of all, have you trusted in Christ? How, do, do you know for sure, first of all, that you're saved? And that's the most important thing. It takes faith to say, Jesus, I believe you're God. I believe you're my creator. And I am going to trust you with my life for salvation. Does that take faith? It does. It does take faith. And so, but when you see it clearly in God's Word, and you say, oh God, I see you, and not only that, your Spirit's convicting me, and you accept Him, that is when you receive Christ. That is salvation, when you accept Him by faith. But um, have you tr do you trust Him day by day? And I believe it's uh, Psalm 34, verse number 8. It's, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. And so, you say, well, Brother Russell, I, I don't know if I can put my faith in Him. I want to say, you're going to find out He's good. And you can trust Him. No matter what you're going through in your life, you can trust Him. And if you do trust in Him, you're going to find out that He's always good. And so, um, so do, you, do you trust Him? Are you sound in faith? So do you put your trust in God's Word? And there's so many different ways we can look at this. Have you fully trusted in His Word? There's going to be verses that's, that you see or read or is given to you that you say, you know, is that really going to be helpful? Or uh, is that really what I need? Is that really going to be the, the, the route I need to take? If God says it, you can trust Him. 
And you can, just, you can just go ahead and put your foundation on that. You can go ahead and put your trust in that and say, okay, God, that's what I need to do. And when you do that, that's what's going to help you be that man in your life or that woman in your life you need to be. And so it's going to take faith. And so faith is unwavering. Faith that is unwavering. So it says sound faith. So all of us have faith that goes up and we're strong. And then we can have faith that goes down and we're weak. All of us do that, right? But um, the key is to um, have it where it only goes up and down a little. And we're pretty much staying up here. Does that make sense? That's the key. We're all going to have faith that goes up and down. Don't, don't, don't think that you can always just be up here on your faith. That's why he says faith of a grain of a mustard seed. You can move a mountain. That's why he says even a little faith can do a lot, right? So, but faith is when, when un, a sound faith, unwavering faith is not when you're, uh, your faith's way down here and you're like, I don't know even if I believe in God at all. I don't know what's going on in my life. The next, next day you're like, you know what, look at that verse. I'm just, you know, they're up here. The next verse, you're, the next day you're down here. Or even the same day, you're zoom, zoom. That's, that's, that's wavering faith, right? So sound faith is when it's solid, it's strong, and you're, and you're staying in the God's Word, and you're staying in prayer, and you're, and, you're, and you're putting your trust in Him day by day, and you're continuing to stay strong. And, and when, when uh, things come your way that try to break that faith, or you say, you know, I'm just going to keep staying strong, I'm gonna, and you have verses that, that you come back to to help you, and you know, all those things. And so, um, so sound faith. So that's so important as a young, or as an aged man, it says, sound in faith. And so when someone can say, do you have faith in God? In fact, they don't even ask you, because they look at you and they can say, that guy has faith. You can see it, right? I can, I can just look at that man, or I can look at that lady, and I can say, man, they have great faith. Have you ever met people like that? That's what it's saying. Have faith that doesn't waver. And then, um, and then next is charity. Next is charity. In, in verse number two, it says, in charity. And so um, charity is, I believe, the most important thing you can have in your life when it comes to following God. You need to have a truth, understanding what God's Word is, but charity is, 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 the, is obeying that truth that God has given. So what is charity? Charity is love. And so just plain, uh, make it as plain as can be. Some, there's sometimes when, when actually it's, it's, it's translated as love. Charity is this. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a giving love. Does that make sense? It's a unselfish, it's a unconditional love. And so that's the love that God has for us. It's a give, he, he gave His Son to die on a cross for us. He, uh, he, he gives us mercy when we keep on making mistakes. It's an unconditional love. That's, that's the kind of love God has. That's the kind of love He tells us to have too. That same type of love. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a forgiving love. It's a merciful love. It's an unconditional love. And it's an unselfish love. Let's look over in 1 Corinthians chapter um, 13. And we'll look at just a couple things here. If you want to go back and look at what truly charity is, study this whole passage. But we're not going to have time to do that today. But 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, they call it the love chapter. And it talks about charity. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5, I just want to look at two things. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5. It says here, it says, um, this is talking about charity. See the verse before, and in fact the whole passage is talking about charity if you look at it. But um, charity, it says, uh, charity suffereth long and is kind, envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Then it says this, doth not behave itself unseemly. And then I just want to look at this, this next phrase, seeketh not her own. So charity is unselfish. See that? It doesn't seek its own first. It doesn't seek itself first. It's, it seeks others first. And so truly to, to love with a charity love, an unconditional love, means you're putting yourself last and you're putting others first. You're putting yourself last and you're putting God first. Does that make sense? That is charity. And so, um, so to, to have a true charity, it's an unselfish love in your life. And so that, is, that goes against that flesh we were talking about earlier, right? Like it? As a, as a, as a dad... If I was going to tell one of my kids to say, hey, we are going to be giving out ice cream, and I want you to dish out all the ice cream for all your brothers and sisters, and as they're dishing it out, they're going to be looking and saying, that one's got a little more in it. That's, that's going to be which one I pick. And so to make it fair, because that's just the nature, you say this, I'll let you dish them all out, but everybody else gets to pick first, and you have to pick last. And they're like, 
Better make this even, right? Start taking a little bit out of this one and putting it over here. You know what? You know why that we, we I mean, I remember how it was when I was growing up, and, and we would be looking, I'll be looking at the food, and I'll be saying, okay, there's two pieces of cornbread la left, and they're just about done with theirs. I'm just about done with mine. If I eat my cornbread real fast, then I'll be able to get one of those last pieces. Anybody else? I don't know if anybody else did that or not. But I mean, that's, 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 that's our nature. We look at something, we say, ooh, wow. And that's, that's that selfish part of us. It's hard. It is, because that's the way we look at things. But to be unselfish basically means, um, you know what, uh, if there's, if there's you know, the smaller one, I'll take the smaller one. You know what, if, if, there's, if, there's, uh, if there's other things that, that, are, that are, you know, I'll let them go first. I'll go last. When it comes to, you know, maybe in a line to get something, I'll let the other ones go first. And it, that's unselfish. That's, 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 that's what it means to be a mature in Christ. It means you're just thinking about others first. Now that does not, that goes against all of our flesh, doesn't it? I'm just, unless it's just me. I mean, am I the only one here that's selfish? That's all of us. We, 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 we fight that all the time, do we not? And it's, it's that battle always going on. So um, to, to have charity basically means to, um, to uh, have unselfish love. Seeking not your own. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 5. Or 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 5. And then also in 1 Corinthians 15, or, I'm sorry, 13. And let's look in verse number 5 again. And it says, Is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Is not easily provoked. I mean, that's the patient, which he talks about as well here coming up. And it says, thinketh no evil. It means, it means you don't think evil about somebody. You always think the best. And so when, when, when there's a situation, instead of always thinking the worst, you always think the best instead. That is charity. And until you find out, I mean, we have a, our court system basically means you're innocent until proven guilty, right? And so that's kind of the way God says we were supposed to, may, they may have got that from here, I don't know. But it's basically saying, you know what, I'm going I'm to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to, um, I'm not going to think the, the worst case scenario, I'm going to think the best case scenario about someone. Does that make sense? And then of course you find out the facts, then, then facts are facts, they don't, they don't lie, right? But when it comes to assuming, always assume the best. Does that make sense? And when we do that, that is another definition of charity. It's not thinking the evil, thinketh, charity thinketh no evil. It, think, it doesn't look at the bad. It, it's, it's willing to, to, to cover the bad because love covereth all sins and only look at the good and say, because I love that person, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see the, see the good. And so that is, um, that is charity. It's thinketh no evil. And then I want to say this, sin puts out love's fire. Sin puts out love's fire. So if you have sin, you're going to have less love. If you have sin in your life, you're going to have less love in your life. And look at this verse in, um, in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 12. Matthew 24, verse number 12, it says this, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And so we can look at that one more time, Matthew 24, uh, 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And so if you have iniquity abounding, your love is going to get colder and colder and colder. So that's why I made that statement. Sin puts out love's fire. It makes love cold. And so the more sin you have, the colder your love is going to be. And so, and then, um, so, um, so it comes to so many different things, loving uh, your children. And I thought that was interesting how it's talking about here in Titus chapter 2, where it talked about the, uh, the, the, the wives or the young ladies, I believe. Let's go back over there because I, I just wanted to point this out real quick. And we're going to continue on, but um, Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 4. And this is talking about the young women. It says, to teach, the older women are supposed to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands. And then it says to love their children, to love their children. And I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to mention this because I believe this applies to the ladies and young ladies. And I believe, you know, that's obvious. But I want to say this applies to men too. Men should love their children. Men should... But what is love again? Unconditional love means you're putting them first. You're thinking about them. And so I remember uh, um, a, uh, a person, and they just found out that they, uh, that they had a child, and it was later on in life. And, and, he was, and he was talking about how that he had set up an appointment to go see them and spend time with them. And at, at one point, he was, this, this, this individual, which doesn't live here, but anyway, he, is, he was uh, really struggling, and he was really in an addiction. He was never there for his kids. He was never around. He, you know, big, big struggle in life. You know, you know what I'm talking about. That can happen, right? 
Big, big struggle. Well, he got saved and he got his life right and he started living right. And, he, and then later on he found out he had a, a young, a young, like a 12, 11, 12 year old girl. He said, wow, well, you know what? He made a point to get to know her. He made a point to become part of her life. He made a point to say, okay, I want to, I want to let this, this young lady know that she does have a dad. And, and of course, if he loves the Lord, now he can, he can, he can allow his influence to, to influence her because every person, every girl, I could say this, really needs their dad. Every boy really needs their dad. And that's why I believe it's a call out to dads today to step up and be the dads they're supposed to be. And it says here that they need to love their children too. And I know it's uh, uh, applicable to the ladies, but it's definitely applicable to the men too. So that may basically mean putting yourself last, not first. And I believe it's so important now. I, I, there's, there's so much hurt out there where someone say, well, my dad wasn't there for me. My dad never helped me. My dad did this to me. On and on, it's, uh, there's, uh, there's, it's out there, okay? I know it's out there. But the right attitude is to say, I'm going to forgive my dad. I'm going to love him because God told me to love him. And I want, I want to have a, a relationship, even if it's limited, according to what they, maybe has happened in your life. But even if it's limited, I'm going to, I, want to, I want to have my dad in my life. And maybe you can say, well, I, don't, I have bitterness. Ask God to help you forgive them. That's what you need to do. You need to forgive them. Well, they're not even alive anymore. I can't go tell them I, I forgive them. You know, just forgive them in your heart. And God can take that and, 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 and use that and give you, uh, give you a, a release from that, 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 uh, that burden that you're carrying. And, you can, and you, can, you can have that in your life. But I want to say, dads, let's be there for our kids. Some dads are not in the home with their kids. We'll reach into their life and be there for them. Some dads are in the home, but they're just too busy for their kids. They don't spend time with them. Be there for your kids. And that's a, that's a good message for me, too. That's a good message for me too. So I can I can uh, I can receive information from that. Now let's just look at a couple more things. We're gonna we're gonna finish up here. But that was the, to the older men. There it talked about uh, charity, and then last of all it's, it's talked about patience, and it says charity and impatience. And I believe that that there is what it's talking about in First Corinthians uh, chapter number thirteen as well. Being patient, and we won't spend a lot of time there. But men need to be pa patient, not easily provoked. That's per patient, right? And so uh, my dad used to give me. Instruction, and I would even say spankings, because I have a little brother that's back there on that wall that's it's in Africa right now, and I used to get spankings for provoking my brother to wrath. I mean, I would, I would make him mad. I would do stuff to make him mad. I would push his buttons. And I remember getting in trouble for that. And so, um, and so that I want to say that there's going to be some people in your life that do that to you. Right? Be patient. Keep loving. Don't, don't, uh, don't uh, write them off. Don't, don't uh, dismiss them as not a friend. Keep on loving them no matter what. I and mean, that's what we see as patient. And then um, younger, younger men, we're not going to get a chance to really get, dive into all this. We're going to look over and just go through it real quickly. And so in verse number 6, it says here, Younger men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So the same thing. It says for the, the men sober, the older men as well for the younger men. And it says likewise to exhort to be sober-minded. And then also it said, um, in all things showing yourself a pattern of good works. And so a pattern uh, is, is something that you can see over and over. Does that make sense? Just, I think actually one of my daughters had made some kind of pattern. And I, I'm supposed to look at it. And I'm not sure. I, think, I don't think she gave me the right paper. Because I was supposed to look at this pattern. And I said, oh, did you see the pattern? I'm like, I don't remember the pattern. <laughs> I looked at the paper maybe, but I don't remember seeing a pattern. So I, but anyways, a pattern is when you do something, then you do it again, then you do it again. And, and you see patterns in, in, in artwork, you see patterns in people's life. It's something you do over and over and over. So here it says showing a pattern of good works. So when somebody looks into your life as a young man, they need to see a pattern of, uh, and that basically means consistency. Something you do over and over. Something you do over and over. So you, the most important things you're going to do in your life is going to be reading your Bible and praying. Over and over, every single day. And I've been around people that they, they've, they've struggled, and I get around them, and they say, you know what, I'm just really, really, really struggling right now. And, and, and I give them some verses, and they're like, man, that was really helpful. I, I need to get back into the Bible. I haven't been reading my Bible. And I mean, they were struggling with something really bad, and they're like, man, that was really helpful. And it wasn't me, it was just God's Word. And so having that, that consistency is so important. But that pattern, when someone looks into your life, can they see a pattern of good works? Can they see things that you're doing that are for the Lord? Can they see a, a pattern when it comes to you being in God's house? 
Can they see a pattern when it comes to um, uh, just being faithful to your family and, and being faithful to what you're supposed to be doing? Can they see a pattern when it comes to going to work and being on work on t- at work on time? Can they see a pattern? He said, man, they, 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 they don't call in. They, they show up to work. You know, and they, even when they're, um, even when they're uh, uh, sometimes people call in, they say they're sick and they're not, right? They don't do that. I can see a pattern. They're just setting patterns. That is so important in our life. And so that pattern of good works. And then um, just for sake of time, we'll move on. But also it says, in, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, and so having a pure doctrine, and um, in doctrine showing uncorruptness. When, when, I believe this is so, so important for, uh, especially, uh, mentions this for young men. And we have some young men in here. Who's young? Everybody's raising their hand, right? That's what I, I, me too. I'm young. But you know, uh, especially, and this obviously will be for everybody. And so, uh, doc, and in doctrine is showing uncorruptness. And this will be for ladies too. Uh, very obvious, you know, when it comes to doctrine, you need to have pure doctrine. Doctrine that's not corrupt. What is doctrine? It's teaching. So, what was he talking about? He was talking about God's Word, biblical teaching. So, when, when, when you, when you um, what, what you build your foundation on is going to be doctrine. Right, and so there's 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 some uh, very important doctrines, and some people call them the fundamentals of the faith. And I just want to go through these. There are five of them. You can write them down if you want, or you can ask later for it. But these are the fundamentals of the faith. The first one is the deity of Christ. The deity of Christ. What does that mean? Deity means God. So basically, that means is this: Jesus is God. That's very important, isn't it? That's a doctrine, a fundamental doctrine, a pure doctrine of the Bible. So if somebody would come up to you and say, well, I, don't, I think maybe Jesus was a good teacher. Maybe he was a good prophet. Maybe he, was, he, he, he did a lot of good things. He was a good miracle worker. But I don't think he was God. You know, you have to believe that Jesus is God to be saved. There's no other way to get saved unless you believe that Jesus is God. And so there's some uh, churches out there that teach that Jesus is not God. They'll say, well, the Father was God, but Jesus, he's, he was just a good person. No. John chapter 1, verse number 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So Jesus is God. It's very, very important. The next one is the virgin birth of Christ. And so was Jesus born of a virgin? Absolutely, he was. The Bible makes that very clear. Isaiah chapter nine, verse number six, and other play, or Isaiah chapter seven, verse number fourteen, and other places as well show us very clearly that Mary had never physically been with a man. So that that was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. And so this is very important. Uh, fundamentals: the blood atonement, the blood atonement. And we can see that in so many different places as well. We talk. We, what do we What do we sing today? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Of Jesus, right? And so that's the blood atonement. So all our sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, every single one needs their sin washed by the blood of Jesus. That's why he went to a cross. And so that's a very important doctrine, isn't it? So if someone says, Well, I think you can just go to heaven by being a good person. Nope. There has to be the blood atonement. The only way you get to heaven is by being washed in the blood of Jesus. And how do you get washed in the blood of Jesus? By being good? No, by receiving Christ, as you say, by faith. And so, so, so very important. So that's the, uh, those deity of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, the blood atonement of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ. Did Jesus rise from the dead? He did. On that third day, and there's, of course, lots and lots of Scripture, and we've looked at that in different places. 1 Corinthians 15, actually, that whole chapter is a resurrection chapter, talks about that. At the end of the Gospels, we see Jesus rising from the dead. He really did die. And he really was in that grave for three days. And on the third day, he really came out. And he really is alive today. And you can go to that tomb there in, outside of Jerusalem. You can look in there, and it says, He is not here, for he is risen on it. He is not there. You can't find Jesus' bones anywhere. He is alive. And not only someone said, well, How do you know he lives? I love that song. It says, You ask me how, you know, I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And so, yes, he's alive. And then, and then um, so we see the uh, bodily resurrection. And then last of all, the inerrancy of the scriptures themselves. God's word is given to us and there is no error whatsoever in the Bible. There's going to be a lot of people that will challenge that. There's some people that they come up with their own book and say, well, we don't, we, we, we have a Bible, but we're going to make our own book. And they, they, they came up with a new book. You probably know what I'm talking about, right? 
And they, they have that new book, and they, and they say, this is what we believe. And then any time, because there's so many different places that that new book that they came up with, which is not a Bible, is false, does not line up with the Bible, you know what they say? Hmm, well, maybe the Bible has some errors. That's what they say. It's not true. Because you can see, of course, lots and lots of verses, and you can examine it. There's no contradictions, and God's Word is 100% without error. So do I hold, do I hold God's Word today? Is it totally um, without error? Absolutely. It's, we were given to it from God. And so, um, so we see that pure doctrine. And so he's saying, young men, if somebody comes up to you and says, why do you believe in Jesus? Is it real? Can you be able to take the Bible and show how you know for sure? This is, this is what the Bible says. This is how I know that Jesus is real. He rose again. He was born of a virgin. You know, and, and God's Word is true. You'll be able to show them from the Scriptures. That's something that we don't have time to really get into today. I've uh, got a lot of different Scriptures we can look at, and hopefully in the future we can. But uh, for each one of those, I believe that re- would require a lesson, right? And so as we, as we continue on, just the last few things, and we're done here. Back in Titus, in chapter number 2. And let's look here in, in verse number uh, 7. It says, in, in, all, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, there's that word again, and then sincerity means being real. Being real. Uh, being the same way all the way through. When you see, uh, what you see is what you get. So I kind of picture it uh, uh, like this. This ring, they make some that are gold plated, right? Well, this, this one actually is all the way through. It's, 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 I don't remember what it's 14 karat. Actually, I think there actually was a little tiny piece where they cut it and started it back together. They used silver. So I guess it's not quite sincere all the way through, right? A little spot in there where they used some silver solder to uh, a friend of mine who made it smaller because I kept losing it. And so, but anyways, um, uh, is it, when you see something, you want it to be pure and real all the way through, don't you? And that's the way we need to be with people, with, our, with, with each other, with other people. Be real. Be sincere. Sincerity basically means that you're, what, you, what you see on the outside is the same on the inside. And so that's something when it comes to being a man. Be real all the way through. Be honest as well. And so um, be the same way. May we, uh, may we uh, sincerely, sincerely care about others. You ever been talking to someone and you realize right when you're talking to them that they're not really listening and they're not really caring what I'm saying? Anybody ever? It's kind of like... Okay, well, I guess I'll just stop talking. I, I've felt that way before, haven't you? I guess I shouldn't, I just quit talking because I don't think they're, they're, they, they pretend like they're listening, but they're, they're not there. And I, I've been that a couple times before where I, you know, I was like, I catch myself, oh, you know, I need to listen, right? And so, um, but you know what? Uh, being sincere means you truly care about somebody else. And so, as well, it's part of being that mature person. And last of all, sound speech. And a sound speech in Daniel, and it says there's sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is con- of the contrary may uh, may uh, a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. And so, um, so basically, that means you have a speech that is honest, speech that is your your word is true. When I say yes, I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And I think about Daniel, and it says that they, they, they came to Daniel, these, these men, they're trying to find something in his life. Daniel chapter 6, I believe it's verse number 4. And they examined Daniel's life. Now, you've got to understand this. When Daniel went into the lion's den, he was an old man. He'd, he'd already lived through the, uh, several different kings in, in, in Babylon. He was an old man. So he had all this, this time that he had lived. He was a very old, he was, I don't know about very old, but he was getting to be an older, older guy, older, older man. And he was now uh, made president, and some other people did not like that. They were envious. Oh, why does Daniel get to have this spot? He's not even a Babylonian. He's a Jew. They were, they were upset. So they started to examine his life. So all his life he had been under kings. He had been a, like an advisor. He had been a counselor. He had been, a, he'd, he'd been a very, very important person in the government of Babylon all his whole life. God had done it. It was important. And so they started to examine his life. They started to overturn the pages. And there's like, surely we can find something against him. That's what they do to every president, right? When someone's running for office, they're trying to find something. They're, surely they're looking, they're looking, they're looking. And they're like, what about this? We, we can make up something here. And they say, wait a second. If we say that about Daniel, everybody's going to know we're lying. They, they, everybody knows Daniel. If we say that, nobody's going to believe us anyway. That's what, that's what it's saying right here. It's kind of that same situation. It says, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. So if they say, if we, if we said that about him, nobody, everybody's going to know it's not true. Daniel, it says in his whole life, he's been faithful. He's been faithful. That's, that's the picture of what he's talking about when it says having, that, having that, um, that sound speech. That they can examine your words. And you say, yes, I'm going to do something. 
He always does it. They examine your words and they say, yes, when he says something, it's true. If he tells me something, I know it's true. I just know it's true because he always tells the truth. He doesn't lie. It's going to be honest. Now, obviously, we're, we're, we're not perfect, right? Something we can strive for. Nobody in here is always going to tell the truth because we're, we're not perfect. With God's help, we can become more and more like Daniel and most importantly like Christ. We can have that sound speech. And so um, keep your word. Keep your word when you, when you give your word. So anyway, just a few thoughts we can take there from the book of Titus. And we didn't really even get into the ladies' parts and I'm sure there's so much there that could be covered as well. Maybe Mother's Day. I don't know. Next year. So anyway, so many different things. So let's go ahead and have a um, have an invitation time. And I tell you what, as my wife comes, let's, let's just do this.